All right, now ready for some crazy proofs. Uh, these are tough ones. I might even falter a little bit. Um, but the main thing to remember is that if you use the tools I've talked about, reciprocals, turning everything into sines and cosines, and the identities, and maybe even a fraction trick here or there, you'll, um, you, know, you can solve any one of these. It might take you a while. It might take 20 minutes. You might need to ask your teacher. But hey, the important thing to remember is that there's a lot of different ways to do these. And if you go off on the wrong track, as long as you keep obeying your algebra, you'll, you'll get there eventually. And uh, you know, one thing I don't, one thing about teachers is that they, they tend to practice these problems. So you know, remembering back to my trig class, the trig prof, the trig teacher, would put up some crazy proof and just do it like it's no big deal. And I think either they're using notes or because you're in like seventh period and they've done it six other times that day, they just know it like the back of their hand already. But it doesn't really convey what actually happens when even a really good trig student solves these things, which is you have to sit there poking at it for a while. And you might take some wrong turns, and you might have to sit there wondering, thinking about it, whatever. So uh, hopefully I don't come off quite as highly polished because I'm doing that because I haven't practiced, but also because I don't, you know, I want to show you guys the process for actually solving these instead of some magical thing that teachers do. And by the way, this is for honors only. These are really hard proofs. So if you're in regular trig, you should not be here right now. You're welcome to stay, though. I mean, I'm not going to kick you out or anything, but... All right, let's see what happens. So, immediately I look at this and it does not look good. Everything's already in terms of sines and cosines, right? So I can't use a couple of my tricks. And then there is a cosine squared, which is great. But the problem is instead of one cosine squared, there's a two in front of it. So that kind of messes things up. But you know what? I don't really see any other options. So I'm gonna try and just manipulate this top until it looks like something I like better. Because I kind of wish it was 1 minus cosine squared, right? If it was 1 minus cosine squared, that would be an identity. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to split this into two separate things. So I'm going to, instead of 1 minus 2 cosine squared, I'm going to make it 1 minus cosine squared minus cosine squared. Now you can see this was legal because if, you had, if I had given you this at first, you could just say, oh, combine like terms. Negative cosine squared, negative cosine squared is negative 2 cosine squared. In this, I'm going to do the opposite, though. I'm going to turn something that was neater into something messier, just so I can get this by itself. Because 1 minus cosine squared, if you look at your sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1, you can rearrange that to get that this is sine squared. So I got sine squared minus cosine upstairs, so squared upside, yeah, upstairs. And I've got a cosine times sine downstairs. Um, what to do? I don't actually know exactly where this is headed. I just know that anytime you can use an identity, it's a good idea. Um, you know what? The next thing I notice is that on the right side here, I have two separate terms. There's a tangent and there's a cotangent, and they're separated by a minus sign, which means they're two separate terms, term one and term two. But on the left, I just have one giant fraction, which is basically one term. So I wonder if the thing I should do is split this into two separate fractions. I can take sine squared over this is one of my terms, and the negative cosine squared over this is my other term. So I'm going to do that. We'll get sine squared over cosine times sine. And this is already looking good because it looks like a sine will cancel. And then minus cosine squared over cosine times sine. And now a cosine is going to cancel. So that's pretty good. Get rid of that. It cancels that. One of these cancels that one. And we get. Oops, I canceled the wrong one on that. Cosine cancels cosine. So, now the way I caught that mistake was I looked at that and said, huh, that's a one. Then I looked up at why, where I wanted to go and I was like, that's a cotangent. The two did not match up. The nice thing about proofs is you know where you're headed. You don't have to worry about getting the wrong answer or not. You just have to worry about actually getting there. So, sine over cosine is tangent. And cosine over sine is cotangent. So, it worked out. Now the key strategy I want to point out here is that instead of making things neater, we made it messier. We took a two cosine squared and turned it into a cosine squared and a cosine squared. We took a cosine, you know, we took one big fraction and turned it into two separate fractions. That's a trick that works in calculus a lot too when you're trying to get a tough problem. So in these tricks, in these trick proofs, sometimes you're messing things up instead of making them neater. Kind of like the, the opposite of what you've been doing in algebra all these years. All right, here's another one. We've got sines and cosines already, so I can't you know, transform anything. 
Um, hmm. I like the look. I like the fact there's a lot of signs and cosines because it makes me think I could use an identity. The only problem is I've got weird powers. I've got odd powers of sine and cosine. But it looks like the smart play might be to um, fact, you know, factor out a sine from upstairs. So, I'll, so that'll bring this down to a sine squared. I can do the same thing downstairs. So if we do sine theta.